production underwriting for Ruckus has been made possible in part by the generous contributions from Fred and Lou Hartwig and from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly food for thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon, joined by the Ruckettes, Kansas City Star editorial writer Yale Abahaka, Gwen Grant, president and CEO of the Kansas City Urban League, media and communications consultant Mary O'Halloran, and lobbyist Woody Kozad with the Kozad Company. This week, by the way, Ruckus begins its 17th season here on public television, KCPT. Well, when we did that first Ruckus program nearly two decades ago, Columnist Steve Rose was here taking part in the discussion, and now, as then, his views provoke debate. In his last Kansas City Star column of last year, Rose offered predictions for the new year. Steve foresees 2014 election victories for Governor Sam Brownback and Senator Pat Roberts, but an upset defeat of Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach. Let's begin with the gubernatorial race. Rose says the race between Brownback, the incumbent Republican, and Democratic challenger Paul Davis is going to be close. Is Rose close to being right, Mary? He's close, and uh, it's already close. Are you conceding that Brownback is He's going to be the victor? Oh, no, no, close. <laughs> close. <laughs> I agree with him. A good, good prognostication there, Steve. Uh, uh, it is already close. As a matter of fact, some polls have uh, uh, the Davis dock docking ticket. Paul Davis, a former minority leader, or current minority leader of, in the Democrats in the Kansas House, and Jill Docking of the Dockings. Is she the reason that Davis is getting more attention than you might expect uh, well, an unknown challenger there, to get? There is some of that. You know, I was at a recent gathering where lots of Democrats that have been more active in the party in Kansas than I have, and they all wanted to meet Jill Docking because they like her father-in-law and her, you know, the family, they want to meet. She's a very, very compelling person, and I think she'd make a great partner for, uh, for Paul. Um, he's doing very well. I mean, this, this month, or just this, this week, as a matter of fact, uh, Paul Davis filed his first forms with the state um, commission that keeps track of money, and he's passed the $1 million mark, and, and that is a good a benchmark for a new candidate taking on an incumbent governor who uh, is as powerful as Sam Brownback is. Um, that's a reflection, I think, of his willingness to do a bipartisan campaign. And I think Brownback now has about $2 million uh, ready well, he, to go into campaign. He will have as many millions and, and, as he needs. And, and in a state that's one of the most reliably Republican in the country, and you have a man like Sam Brownback who has never lost a bid for election. Right, Woody, true. is there any legitimate reason to think that, that he's in danger? Well, if I were a Democrat, I'd be a little worried about the fact that they're talking so much about their lieutenant governor candidate. But, uh, yeah, what? the danger is this. Uh, he's done something that governors in, in Missouri and Kansas don't do, which is he's done something. Most Missouri and Kansas governors, certainly in their first terms, uh, lie low, uh, don't do very much, don't arouse any controversy, and you go out and ask the average voter, how's governor so-and-so doing? And they say, he or she, oh, I'm doing okay. Yeah, I'm mean, doing all right. What are they doing? Well, I don't know, but they're doing all right. And they coast to re-election. Uh, and and it, it's not often that you get a governor defeated. Uh, it's either outside factors. This, nationally, the party's doing very badly, so Kit Bond loses it to Joe Teasdale. Or you get somebody who does something controversial. Brownback has actually done something. He stepped up and changed the tax code and so on. Well, and the, and, well, well, and yeah. that yeah. makes him controversial. Yeah, and Yale, we hear so much about Yale, we hear about moderate Republicans who are going to turn away from the GOP. Uh -huh. And do you know any of those? Have you run across any? Is there <laughs> no. some organized effort? Is there oh, a yes. pragmatic oh, there Republican oh, my, running yes, out and is. saying, let's all get together yes. and vote for the Democratic nominee? Um, there is an organized effort, but just really to fault and Woody's very important point, I think Sam Brownback will be rewarded or punished based on what he did come in November. In other words, the jobs thing will be part of the campaign and Davis will be making a big deal about it if the jobs have not materialized in a fashion that Brownback promised. Two, Davis will be making a big deal if there's some school funding mess up yeah. or whatever. So all those events still have to play out. Now I would say that I think Brownback has a very 
not a very serious chance of winning because, first of all, the jobs might materialize, but second of all, he may be able to avoid this school thing and, you know, and put a little bit more money into the, the university. The school thing you're talking about is the Supreme Court looking education. at the uh, right. uh, funding for well, schools. So I, so I think there are a lot of things still to play out here. A moderate Republican who has joined Paul Davis's campaign. Wendell Lady. Wendell Lady, the former who? Speaker, Republican <laughs> Speaker of the, of the, the yeah, Kansas House, as well as President of the Regents, the Board of Regents. That's a good example. You Wanted to name, there's one. I well, think what I'm saying is there an organized effort to pull oh, moderate yeah, Republicans absolutely. away from the GOP. Paul Davis is running not first on jobs but on the education, and he's doing a deliberately bipartisan, openly bipartisan campaign, and that's that has potential. Let for me growth. ask Gwen a couple of quick questions, then we have to move on. <laughs> Senator Pat Roberts, do you think he's in any danger of, <laughs> of not being not. nominated and not being reelected? <laughs> of course not. And do you, mean, you, know, Steve you, you have Steve right Rose on. predicting that Chris Kobach will not win the race for right. Secretary of State and then <coughs> says his prediction is no good that he thinks Kobach will win oh, no. his race for re-election. What I do you think? I certainly hope his prediction is accurate and Chris Kobach will not win his uh, re-election bid. I, I think uh, Steve's pre predictions were really pretty easy to do. <laughs> By the way, since Kansas <laughs> became a state, there have been 45 governors, 32 have been Republicans, 11 have been Democrats, and two have been populists. Now that the legal challenge to the downtown streetcar starter line has been rejected, the argument about the potential benefits begins anew. Supporters claim the streetcar system is just the first step in what will become a major metro-wide operation. Backers also believe the starter line will generate economic development, bringing more business to downtown. At least one business owner affected by the plan, Sue Burke, says there will indeed be economic consequences, but not good ones. Burke was one of the plaintiffs in the failed lawsuit. She claims the system's higher taxes are driving customers away from her business, and that means she will likely move her air filter company to Kansas, where she says they seem to encourage business. Is Ms. Burke the first of many who will head west, or is she simply a sore loser, Woody? Well, look, this area that the, that the tax was raised in is small enough that if a number of small business people move out of there, probably the city's not going to notice it. Um, the, uh, so I don't know whether the lady's a sore loser or what, but I, I, if there's movement to Kansas, it's going to be because of the generally more business favorable uh, atmosphere over there and the, ta and the tax reduction. Uh, and it'll be mostly small businesses. Uh, the uh, streetcar in and of itself, if, if history's any indicator from other cities, Along the line of where the streetcar is, you get more, you get economic development. The property owners who are paying the tax, or a portion of the tax, mm -hmm. uh, become the big beneficiaries of the streetcar. And it's what's happened right. in places like Washington, D.C. And uh, of course, Washington's a world unto itself. But in other Why places. Why do they object to it? Uh, they don't want to pay the tax. And they haven't seen but you the said they're the beneficiaries. I mean, they are the beneficiaries of the development that comes. No. If I have property there for rent, this is good news for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, uh, it's going to be more accessible. People are going to be able to move around that area more easily. The history in other cities, I'm just, you know, I don't buy pie in the sky, but if you look at other towns, you put in a light rail line along that line. It's beneficial to the adjacent property. Well, is it well, beneficial to businesses already in existence oh, there? Absolutely. And if so, I, why do they me, so let many me object? Let me just offer a little con consolation for the Sue Burks alert. I said, no, she's not a sore loser. She is a small business in an area of great big businesses. And it's likely that she doesn't fit there anymore. Shouldn't and I feel sorry. I feel sorry for for owners like that because they are hurt. She will benefit eventually if she sells her building. I don't know if she rents or what, but if she owns a building, she'll benefit in the end. But uh, in the meantime, her property taxes will go up because, of course, the valuations it it will indeed cause things to be more valuable. Okay. We already three three city that. employees are headed to Spain <coughs> to take a look at the way uh, streetcars are built. Is that right. an issue, a concern, a problem? It costs about $8,000. No. It's gotten some news coverage. Well, it has, and I mean, I understand why, because when, when they have a $100 million streetcar line, a $100 million streetcar line, $7,000! I can understand $7,000, but no, it seems to be justifiable. It's not a, it's not a concern, um, basically. But the important thing, of course, is that they get the street line, this right. first two miles right. Mm -hmm. So two points. One, 
yes, it so far has helped development downtown, not hurt it. You have hotels, you have apartment complexes all being developed, all, some of them new, some of them continuing, and all of them going on since the streetcar happened. So one development is okay. Is that related, do you think, those uh, Some of them have been related, but kind of for the reason that Woody said, we're going to have fixed rail along a, a route, which is Maine. Well, I can be in Baltimore, I can be in Maine, I'm close to a fixed route. It's not going to go anywhere like a bus route can in six months or two days or whatever. So, so the development angle so far is very good. Now here's the second point, point. this is why I say you've got to get this right. They're going to come later this year, at least the plan is, for a multi-hundred million dollar extension, proposed extension of streetcar, and that could go east on 31st, east on Independence, and south on Main Street. And if that happens, they sure don't want a lot of negative publicity about the first two miles. So every step in the next four, five, six months has to be right by the streetcar authority, by Russ Johnson, by all the people, Sly James, Mayor Sly James, all the people pushing streetcar, they have to get this part right. Like the rollout of the Obamacare. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you ought to be able to streetcar.gov. You better be able to get right. Did, did you not say in a discussion we had about a week ago that uh, these expansions of uh -huh. the streetcar line are likely to be financed or we will be asked to finance them Absolutely. with sales Yeah, taxes? the plan is for a very similar, right, right now the plan is a similar sales tax up to 1% and a similar property tax uh, or property yeah, it'll probably levy increase on people who are or businesses and homes closer to the line, uh, and plus federal money. They'd be a lot, they would need a lot more federal money to do this expansion than they did for the downtown. Look one. forward to all this, Gwen. Is this exciting to you? Absolutely, absolutely. I think you know I've, I've always supported the uh, the light rail. Um, having that come through downtown and it spurs economic development, I think it's a good thing for Kansas City, and and I think you know I'm looking forward to it. Out front and behind the scenes, those are the two places Yale writes that Mayor Sly James will have to step up his game if he and his plans for Kansas City are to succeed in 2014. <coughs> Yale writes in his Kansas City Star column that James needs to be more <coughs> assertive on the police board, play a key part in any decision about KCI, and keep a watchful eye on efforts to change the structure of city government. James has not been afraid to take on the tough issues thus far, Yale writes, and that trade could serve him and Kansas City well in the new year. Yale, it seems you've become a bit of a fan of the Kansas City mayor. Is oh, that I fair mean, to say? I, I think in general have been. Um, the Certainly some of the issues he's tried to hit have not gone well, and I pointed out on the police issue. I mean, a very important issue where he really wanted to have local control be the... Um, um, I guess the end game of the citizens group he appointed and it did not happen. So I really think he's got to step up his game on being on the police board if he wants to get some of the stuff through that he thinks is very important. And part of that is having consolidation and trying to spend Kansas City tax money better. Um, again, we've already talked about the streetcar. Very important for him to be out in front on that well, as well. Let's look at this point about behind the scenes yeah, and up front. Absolutely. The police board would be one good example, would it not? Uh, uh, behind the scenes, making sure that he knows what's going on with the police department yeah. and up front when the board meets publicly. You, exactly. And, you know, he and uh, Chief Forte had a little bit of a public tiff uh, during this whole local control thing where the police chief surprised the mayor. You know, you got to remember, the mayor's on the board who appoints the police chief. Right. And the police chief kind of said, I want to keep local control. It's like, well, you know, no, first of all, nobody asked you right now because this citizens committee is doing it. So, you know, privately he could have, he could have, and he, and he might have, but he could have said, shut up. You know, we don't need the police chief and get involved in this right now. i got a police group looking at it, uh, or a citizen group looking at it. So that's behind the scenes. But out front, yeah, he has to be on the police board saying oh. things. One more thing, to get right, KCI. I mean, the KCI decision at some point will be recommended by this uh, citizens group. We really don't know what it's going to be yet, but if it's anything like, well, we need to revamp and it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, he's going to have to be out front with some kind of good plan. Either I embrace this fully, let's vote on it, or I reject it and we're not going to do it. Do we know you. what his preference is? Has he yeah. said yeah. he yeah. wants yeah. the one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't mind new journal. He wants an improved KCI. Improved. Okay. Well, who doesn't? Well, no, well, a lot of people who say I mean, it's a well, just. But he's, not, it he's not embraced the billion doller no. brand new yeah. facility well, plan. No, he, he right. embraced well, change, though. Right. Really. You know, it, that my, Yale's micro uh, analysis is always kind of interesting, but actually, the popularity of big city mayors depends first on trust. And boy, does he have a high level of it right now. People trust that what he says is what he's going to do and what he's for. They don't sense the usual kind of ambiguity of the people that aren't, aren't popular. Secondly, 
uh, is is the he city heading in the right direction? Is it heading in some direction? That's the first thing. <laughs> and secondly, is it the right direction? You feel that even though you might disagree with him, and I, I, I told you that I was at a social gathering over the, uh, the holidays where the mayor was holding a court at, at this party, and there are people in the group around him that disagreed with him. He was just having a great time trying to persuade them of his point of view, and everybody loved it. And that's the kind of candid openness that people like about this man. Whether they agree with him on the airport or on police uh, local control or not. Yeah, you, so, you could not have done that with Cleaver, Barnes, or Funkhauser. I totally not. agree with you there. Maybe not. Yeah, I totally agree it with you. It was no, totally no, delightful. Yes, Gwen, uh, we've more talked power about, to him. Gwen, we've talked about the strong mayor form of government, and no secret, I'm a big fan of, of that approach to local government. But I would admit that James is an example of being a strong mayor without the charter provisions making that possible. Uh, I would agree. I think he, he is a strong mayor, but uh, like all the other mayors before him, he would like to have the charter change so, you know, that we go to a strong mayor form of government. And um, But I think as uh, Cleaver uh, learned, as Mayor Barnes learned, you've got to learn how to lead out front and from behind in this form of government that we have. And I think Sly James has adapted quite well to that. He seems to have major control of the council. I mean, more so really than any right. other of the mayors before him. They seem to, to You, you uh, can't exactly underestimate the importance exactly. of interpersonal relations, I would assume, in the world of no, politics. Well, well, you know, if you, you don't like Sly, you got a character flaw. He's just, <laughs> he's a, no, he's a great yeah, guy, yeah. personally, a really? great guy. You talk to him, to talk to him is to like him. And, and he's been a lawyer all his life. He's listened to people disagree with him. Right. He's used to it. It doesn't bother him a bit, as Mary said. That, that's his that's, strongest thing. Doesn't he thing do he mediation before. counseling or used to do yeah, and he's mediation? Done, he's, and he's done things as mayor, and they're going to be visible things. Now, the, the bottom line question is how this is public works government. Mm -hmm. right. And a lot of cities have done a lot of public <laughs> works, and in the long haul, it didn't necessarily amount to saving the city. And that's the long haul question for us. All right, while some are still debating Miley Cyrus and the right to twerk, we're moving on to right to work. That legislation, anathema to labor unions, may come up for a vote in this year's Missouri legislative session, or it might end up on the November ballot, or it might just disappear. Right to work laws generally say that workers do not have to join or contribute to unions as a condition of employment. Backers suggest a right to work law attracts businesses to a state, Labor opponents say it's really a right to work for less law. So is there a catalyst that's responsible for bringing the issue center stage in Missouri, Gwen? Well, I think it, it came center stage again with the Boeing um, situation, the union uh, bargaining um, <coughs> issue with Boeing Airlines and the uh, can't in Missouri bidding on that, hopefully wanting to get that, but that's all moot. What point. that was was Boeing threatened to move, threatened to move from Seattle, Seattle if the union didn't extend the right. contract uh, favorable apparently that's, to the company for another union, six or seven years. They reached an agreement, so that's a that's a moot issue. But what it did was caused our local uh, the local proponents of right to work to raise the issue again. And it appears that they're pushing it. I, you know, they just session uh, resumed uh, yesterday, and in the, today's paper, some talk of you know this might be an issue. However, de Democrats who strongly oppose right to work or are threatening to filibuster the issue, um, I think it's going to have a little bit more fuel behind it this session, but my hope is that it will do as it has done in the past and go absolutely nowhere. Governor Nixon will veto it if it, if it, uh, if it does pass, and then it would have to go to a ballot initiative. When it was a ballot initiative, how many years ago it 30, was defeated? Yeah. Thirty years ago it was defeated, and I, my hope is 1978. that. Yeah, and my hope is that Almost the the uh, working class people will understand that right to work is not in their best interest. And a governmental study show that that states with right to work laws have lower uh, wa uh, wage earners; they earn less and they have higher rates of unemployment. It, it does not spur economic development in the way that proponents of right to work pro uh, Mary, proclaim. Mary, do the reasons that unions once flourished still exist today, or have they been <laughs> rectified by government laws, government regulations about 
workplace safety, uh, well, employee it's, it's, treatment? Well, it's hard. It would certainly be hard to make that case since the number of people in unions continues to to decline. I think right now, what is it, 8% in Missouri uh, of people who could belong to unions do. Uh, I think what Republicans, you know, both parties are stuck in this mode of Democrats who are in favor of labor, labor unions and Democrats finance a great deal of the, the, the work of, of getting candidates to run for office successfully, and Republicans are stuck in that labor unions are the, are the uh, source of all evil. Well, now, no, just a second. Do labor unions seem to be the source of all evil no. to Republican <laughs> lawmakers? Some of the material uh, Republicans, that comes out. Uh, Republicans are not. You know, if you, you want to talk to the average Republican and ask them about unions, they're troubled by public employee unions right. a lot more than private sector. Uh, but unions. that's where the future of the union movement apparently is. If there's the union the service sort of so. employees, service but employees, it's a big growth area. It, it is. In, it is interesting. We'll have this discussion when uh, the whole e income disparity argument is mm -hmm. probably at its worst uh, in many many years. Wages have been stagnant for I saw today three decades, which I can't believe, but maybe it has been. You know, if you, you know, if you, if you average all that stuff out, well, not for you. And oh yes, for me. <laughs> oh yeah, for me. Uh, but but if you look at the angle of you know what is right to work really going to help or hurt Missouri. You know, I mean, I think the opponents call it right to be fired, basically, because I mean, it does give more power to the employer. It's not really an employee benefit; it's an employer benefit. Absolutely. With the alleged thing, well, now more employers will flock here because we can fire people when, when you know, when we're we want to. We're already in that. And state. you know, but yet I just, I just don't see it as the big boon for Missouri. Mm -hmm. And you know, I assume that we'll get caught up in politics. Woody, you'll be down again. at the the Missouri legislature back in session now. <laughs> yeah. uh, what issues are going to dominate the the Transfer law is that transfer going to law be will be center? a huge issue, uh, which will then bring up education reform in general. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, so that'll be huge. The tax issue is going to come back. Republicans yeah. will try for a tax right. cut again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so those are the two biggest things I see. I see right to work's not on the level with those two. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the two leading issues I see in this session of the legislature. If they pass, as Gwen said, if they pass a right to work law through the legislature, the governor can veto it. Uh, if they pass an, uh, an HJ, a joint resolution to put, put it on, on the ballot, ballot, the governor has no veto and then it goes to the people. Uh, the question conservatives have to ask themselves, there are going to be a number of things on the ballot already. How many of them do we want out there in one year? Mm -hmm. And that's a tough question for them. And that may affect the way some voters look at Republican candidates well, sure, the, the, in, in 2014 issue, and subsequently. Be, wouldn't you agree, is whether or not they're going to try to push some big you know, Kansas size tax cut for upper income people. I mean, this is a time when there isn't any extra money in the budget in Missouri and the schools have not been funded. Got, got to move on. There is. It is time now for <laughs> Roast and Toast, where the Ruckettes throw bouquets or brick bats at people and events in the news. We start tonight with Gwen. Here's a, a cheers to KCPNL for its recent announcement that it would not pursue rate increases for the next two years, which is great news to consumers, as well as making an investment in wind power, both in Missouri and Kansas. I think these, this is a great move, great corporate social responsibility, great uh, investment in the environment, and cheers to KCPNL. Cheers to the Kansas City Star for doing some lengthier pieces and some series lately. Uh, a roast to the Kansas City Star over the quality of them. Uh, the one on what goes on in Jeff City was, was uh, just sophomoric. Uh, my favorite part was where they said that, that term limits increase the power of lobbyists. You're looking at the only lobbyist in Jeff City who, comp who is for the continuation of term limits. You can't find another one. They hate term limits. Uh, the other one was about the children's division, and it all it, that multi-part piece revealed was a staggering ignorance of how the children's division works in Missouri. Uh, so I, I like you doing longer pieces, Kansas City Star. Just try and get your facts straight. Yale? <laughs> With the Kansas City Star? Well, no. I will. Uh, <laughs> as a KU alum, I'm going to roast the KU Athletic Department, which is proposing to spend $17 million on housing for a little bit more than 60 kids and half of them being basketball players. I mean, this is a total outlandish use of private funds as well as a public university getting involved in this kind of arms race is ridiculous, and I hope it's rescinded by the Kansas Board of Regents next week. 
Well, you can tell that the race for uh, governor in Kansas is, is uh, off and running because uh, Sam Brownback, Governor Sam Brownback, is now responding to Paul Davis's uh, challenges. Uh, Davis is running a pro-education campaign, so the governor comes out saying he's for all-day kindergarten. And all across the state of Kansas, you'll find support for that in both parties and everywhere, except he will pay for it by taking the money from a fund called um, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. There you go, Sophie's Choice, typical Sam Brownback, go for the PR, and then, as the saying goes, stick it to people who are poor. All right, and finally, a toast to colleague and friend Steve Kraske, who invited the Ruckettes to join him on his up-to-date program last week. Yale, Mary, and I talked with Steve about what's ahead for Kansas City in the new year. Steve is an engaging host who handles both the guests and the callers quite well. Thanks to Steve and 89.3 FM KCUR for the invitation. I think this is an embarrassing first for me, the first time I've been seen on television in Levi's and not wearing a necktie. And that is Ruckus for this week. We'll be back next Thursday evening at 7.30. And now on behalf of the Ruckettes and the Ruckus crew, Mike Shannon saying thanks for watching and good night.